podcasting from Portland East to Portland West, Big Pine Key to Pacific Beach, and from San Juan to Guam, this is All Across America. We're here today with Avi Loeb, who's the head of the Galileo Project, founding director of Harvard University's Black Hole Initiative, director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics, and the former chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University from 2011 to 2020. Uh, most recently, he's written two best-selling books on the subject we're here to talk about today, Extraterrestrial and Interstellar. Uh, I call this the frontier of futurism, the frontier of scientific inquiry, of philosophy philosophical thought. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be at your house. It's an honor to have you on the show. And, um, you know, speaking of the fringe of, of science, any good futurism is on the fringe. I reached out to a friend of mine when we scheduled our visit, who I graduated high school with, brilliant guy, PhD astrophysicist, um, helped build the James Webb Telescope, is still a scientist at the uh, foundation that runs it. And I said, I'm going to be meeting with Avi Loeb. And he responded, yikes. And, <laughs> and then, then I said, you know, what do you, what do you think about the divide in astronomy? And his response was, what divide? And I, it, it makes sense because, you know, here you have, I guess, the entire astronomy community and a couple people on the fringe. Uh, but, of course, Galileo, Copernicus would also be considered on the fringe and even crackpots in their day, I guess you could well, say. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. And uh, uh, I should say, even though it sounds futuristic, it may be the past of... Uh, other inhabitants of the universe, okay. because uh, most stars formed billions of years before the sun. Uh, that's a fact. We know it from the star formation history of the universe. Okay. Um, and uh, moreover, it takes um, you know less than a billion years for our own Voyager spacecraft to move from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other side. In fact, I'm doing this calculation with an undergraduate student right now, and so. You know, we are late to the party, that's all I'm saying, and uh, we better check if there is anyone else out there because we can learn from them. Uh, you know, I had the visitor to my home uh, uh, a year ago that was looking at the, the house from a distance from the street uh, where you came from, and uh, my wife said, maybe it's one of your fans. Uh, check it out because he's been staring at our home for uh, a year, for uh, an hour. And uh, I went there, and um, uh, I asked him, what, wh why are you looking at our home? <laughs> and he said, uh, well, I used, I used to live in this house uh, 50 years ago. I was a, a child uh, wow. that lived in this house. And I said, wonderful, nice to meet you, and would you like to stroll in the backyard? Uh, I can show you around. And he said, well, uh, actually, in the backyard, we buried a cat named Tiger, and uh, I said, that name sounds familiar because I saw a tombstone in the backyard and I was worried that it's a tiger that is buried down there. But in <laughs> fact, uh, I'm glad to hear that it's a cat from 50 years ago. I never dug this grave. And uh, what it illustrated to me is that we need to be kind to visitors. Uh, and the ancient Greeks recognized that. And the reason is that um, they may know more about our neighborhood, uh, our backyard, than we know because they existed for longer. Yeah. Humans came to the scene uh, on Earth uh, just a few million years ago, which is one part in, in a thousand of the age of the Earth. And, um, you know, uh, we are arriving to the cosmic play at the end of the play. We are not at the center of stages, Copernicus uh, told us. And, uh, you know, therefore, the play is not about us. Yeah. And uh, we better find other actors who can tell us more about it. And I was actually invited, despite the, the comments you heard from the person you spoke with, um, I should tell you, like yesterday, I met with uh, a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard from the Harvard the School of Design. And he came to me and he said, I finished my PhD in Spain and I arrived here. And I just wanted to let you know that you are the most famous uh, scientist in Spain over the past uh, few years. Wow. And everyone is reading and following what you're doing. Wow. And, um, you know, uh, a few months ago, I was invited to the Munich Security Conference where heads of states uh, are uh, uh, often uh, 
uh, guests and um, there were snipers on the roof. That's the first conference I attended with snipers <laughs> on the roof with the black head covers. And uh, I realized they're not there to protect me. Right. And um, <laughs> that uh, taught me an important lesson that uh, politics is far more controversial than uh, searching for extraterrestrials. Right. And right. uh, despite of the comment that you heard from, I mean, I was the first scientist invited to this event. Wow. And I spoke for 45 minutes at the Q&A um, session, Fireside uh, Chat. And a day later, the Polish government invited me to Torun, Poland, where Nikolaus Copernicus was born 550 years earlier. And okay. they celebrated the event. And so they asked me to give a keynote lecture, and I, the title of my lecture was The Next Copernican Revolution. Mm. Uh, we all know the story of Copernicus. He was a priest, actually, and um, he was very loyal to the church. He didn't want to rock the boat. Your friend would not be upset if he were to live in that time because Copernicus didn't, didn't want to upset uh, anyone. And so, but he noticed that the church couldn't figure out when um, Easter takes place. Uh, they got it wrong by a few days uh, because they had this, the earth at the center of the, of the world. And so he played with the data and realized that if you put the sun in the middle, you can forecast, you can predict when Easter is much better. Wow. And so he gave the model to the church and said, here it is, uh, it can help you forecast. And they were very happy, said, thank you very much. But they banned his book. It was a forbidden book until the 19th century. They said, it's a nice model, but reality is that the earth is at the center. Uh, now, what does this story tell us? That, you know, sometimes the boat is heading in the wrong direction. So you better rock the boat. That's my point. Copernicus thought, no, you shouldn't rock the boat. So his book actually was only printed on his deathbed. He got a copy of it. Galileo Galilei uh, acted differently. He, you know, 50 years later, he was put in house arrest right. because he was very vocal about his view that, uh, you know, the moons of Jupiter indicate that the Earth is not at the center. They move around Jupiter, you know, and that's a matter of common sense. And by the way, it's not uh, old ancient, ancient history. Uh, in 1803, before 1803, people thought that rocks cannot fall from the sky. It makes no right. sense. Rocks are on the ground. How dare you even think that rocks can fall from the sky? It makes no sense. But then there was a meteor shower in, uh, uh, in Liège, uh, France, and uh, there, was, there were too many eye eyewitnesses to deny it. Uh, and... Uh, and, and now my colleagues, the friend that you spoke with, will tell you, oh, yeah, of course, any rock that falls from the sky belongs to the solar system. And I say, no, not every rock. In fact, we saw one a decade ago that uh, was moving so fast that uh, it came from outside the solar system. That's based on U.S. government data, the U.S. Space mm -hmm. Command. We can get into the details. Uh, but, but they insist that it's, it's really controversial to argue otherwise. And I say, well, it's not my data, it's the U.S. government data, and that's right. the agency that reports to the U.S. president about ballistic missiles that may be heading towards the U.S. It's a very serious business. Right. They are getting $30 billion a year, more than NASA. And your friend would find it controversial and would find it uh, problematic to discuss uh, a possibility that an object collided with Earth from outside the solar system because... It's not something that we are used to. So right. my point is, this history keeps repeating. And in the context of rocks, it was also in the, you know, in the case of uh, continental drift. Uh, uh, the idea that you know, Africa fits into uh, Amer the Americas, into an, uh, on the other side of like Antarctica. A puzzle piece. Yeah. And yes. So in fact, you could have driven a car uh, you know, uh, 200 uh, million years ago, you could have driven a car from Australia to Antarctica, to Asia, to Europe, on the same continent, supercontinent. Right. You know, that, is, that was considered heresy uh, 100 years ago. And uh, when, when uh, Wegener proposed it, and he died in 1930 with it being ridiculed. Right. And then people started finding in the 50s evidence for rocks that match on the co different continents right. that we have now and vegetation that matches. So, you know, in the context of rocks, we have three examples, the meteors 
uh, not believed in, people did not believe in, and, and then the continental drift that ended up being explained by uh, tectonic uh, plates. And, right. um, uh, and, uh, and now interstellar objects that I'm working on. So should I feel bad about the comments of the type that you mentioned? No. I just want to attend to the evidence. Right. I mean, which, and that is science. That's what science yeah. is about. And by the way, the people that argue, oh, you shouldn't have gone to the Pacific Ocean to search for evidence and we'll talk about it. Those people, I think, are anti-science because they are pretending to be the uh, protectors of science. Right. And uh, some of them are not even scientists. Some of them are uh, you know, using science done by others to... Uh, gain popularity within, uh, you know, the general public. So they basically publicize science. They don't do science if you check their record. They call themselves astrophysicists, but they haven't published a single scientific paper over the past uh, decade. And I publish every week or two. I write a scientific paper. The latest one I worked on at 4 a.m. this morning, uh, there were uh, referee reports about it. We, this is a paper where I explain that some signal that was recently claimed to be a result of gravitational waves coming from the edge of the universe, from cosmic history, um, it's a pulsar timing array signal, could actually be explained by rocks orbiting around the sun, the, the asteroid belt that we know about, mm -hmm. which is introducing a jitter to the sun, a Brownian motion of the sun. For some reason, they haven't thought about it. And it's just at the right level within a factor of 10 of the signal that was reported. So I wrote a paper about it a couple of weeks ago. It took me one day to come up with the idea, write the paper. So I'm practicing, this is just to illustrate that I'm practicing science. Right. Okay? I'm in the trenches. Yeah. And those people who are just publicizing, I will not mention their names, but there are some bloggers, there are some people that are very well known to the public. Check their record. If they don't publish scientific papers, they're not really scientists. And they criticize some of the work I'm doing. So I say to them, I say, how dare you? It's just like a commentator sitting on the bench looking at a soccer match right. and telling the players how to pass the ball. It's really inappropriate for yeah. them to do that. Do, do you think, I mean, there is so much misinformation and BS on the Internet. Do you think yes. it's become a reactionary in science, almost like a circling of the wagons that, that it, it, and years ago you could be fringe, but you would have to be a, a practicing scientist to be fringe, whereas today there is so much just... Well, the way I think of science is as a way of maintaining your childhood curiosity. And a lot of people pretend to be the adults in the room. And I say to them, you know, I mean, they are really afraid of being curious. They're afraid of exploring new territories, of learning something that they don't know about already. Partly it's because the experts, quote unquote, have been spending decades on a subject and they have their own territory for which they get awards, recognition, and if you right. come to them and say, we, you missed something, they get upset because they wanted to be the ones to re discover that. So, right. so they would dismiss, they would say, the data is wrong, you know, I don't believe the US government, uh, this cannot be interstellar, there were lots of mistakes in the past, therefore this should be a mistake. Like, what kind of an argument is that? I right. don't care about other mistakes, I'm talking about something very specific. And so there are these experts that obviously do not want something new to come from a new kid on the block. I mean, that's their natural tendency. But there is also the jealousy, that, because this subject, I found out, you know, I worked for many years, for decades, on the first stars in the universe, the scientific version of the story of Genesis. I was one of the pioneers. Now the Webb telescope is actually right. observing those. And actually the images of the first galaxies were celebrated in the White House by President Biden. Uh, a couple of years ago. So, so everyone now recognizes, yeah, studying the first stars is indeed a very good uh, subject of research. But I can say that when I had my first graduate student uh, defending his PhD thesis, in the committee was a person who said, How, why would you work on that? You know nothing. It's possible that there are no early galaxies, that the stars didn't exist back then. We had all these criticisms back then, and you know, I was still junior faculty at the time, and I was very careful, and I you know, said, okay, we don't know much. And, but in retrospect, it was complete nonsense, because now it's a very, and, and most of the things we predicted 
came to fruition. You know, the kind of things people are discussing now are all in my textbooks from a decade ago, in my research papers from three decades ago, and, and, and in my review papers from two decades ago. And, and you can find all of the details being discussed now echoing what I was working on. And at the time, there were people who said, yikes, because they worked on stars next to us. They didn't want to think about stars early on in the universe, and they thought maybe they don't exist. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is this is very natural. Now, there is indifference from those subjects like that I worked on, the first stars, the first galaxies, black holes that I worked on. You know, I, I, I worked on imaging black holes, and now we have images. So mm -hmm. in a way, you know, that, that came to fruition. Um, the subject of having a, a neighbor that is intelligent out there, you know, to me, it doesn't sound more hypothetical, more speculative than talking about specific types of dark matter. You know, we don't know what the dark matter is, and over the years, you know, we suggested various possibilities. I worked on them. There was no issue. But here, when you talk about the possibility that all these other stars that you see in the night sky have have a, a, an observer next to them, just like we are next to the sun, you know, what? why is that so controversial? Is you get a lot of heat for that because the public is interested. And yeah. when I, you know, so because I get so much attention from the public and, and um, you know, uh, this subject attracts interest, there are lots of people who are jealous. Yeah. And they're just jealous. They want to step on any flower that rises above the grass level. Yeah. And so that's the reason for saying yikes. Yeah. Is it, is it discomforting in a way in that, you, you know, the multiverse string theory, if it's true or not, it doesn't affect people's daily lives? Yeah, that's another thing that, um, you know, when uh, people talk about extra dimensions for 50 years in the context of string theory or uh, in the second half of the history of string theory, it, was, it became extremely popular to talk about the multiverse, regions of space and time that we have no access to, Okay. And uh, when you say we have no access to, therefore you can't test this idea experimentally or observationally, they would say, oh, we don't know that. We just have to think hard enough. Maybe there will be a way of us testing this idea. At any event, we cannot test it. We cannot access those regions as of yet. And they are outside of our cosmic horizon. And for people working on these ideas, on extra dimensions, on the multiverse, you know, there is no scrutiny. Nobody is saying... Why are you doing that for 50 years? Right. And because it's just intellectual gymnastics, which is allowed. Right. And you, you can, uh, you know, it's just like in the Olympics, people decide, let's run 100 meters and let's see who runs it the best. So in academia, very often what you see is, you know, we don't care about the public because we are here, the public really cannot, <clears throat> we are in an ivory tower, the public cannot really understand what we are doing. It's very complex math. The public cannot follow. Very often the public says things that do not make sense. So let's ignore what the public cares about. In fact, let's remove ourselves from the interests of the public so that we will not get interrupted, okay? And let's define, just like in a 100-meter run, let's define some tasks that we you know, can decide on by just based on community consensus because a lot of people decide that it's a good idea and then just follow them. And it doesn't matter if they describe reality or not, we would still call ourselves physicists. Now, if you call yourself mathematician, that's completely legitimate because mathematics has not, you know, it doesn't have to describe reality, but physics is all about describing reality right. that we live in, the physical reality. And right. to me, it's a betrayal of the profession to say, forget about any experimental evidence for 50 years, which is roughly the duration of an academic career. I mean, I don't mind if you do that for a few years, or, or you on the side, you do it uh, you know, as a hobby. But if you define your entire academic career on this foundation that you will, will never be tested in your lifetime, then that's not physics as far as I can tell. Because the whole idea of physics is that the world of ideas is far greater than the one reality we all share. And experiments allow us to decide which ideas are right and which are wrong. So if we think that we are at the center of the universe, that's a beautiful idea because it gives us importance. The church thinks highly of it. So let's all embrace it. The only problem is the data doesn't support it. 
And so when Copernicus or when Galileo realized that, they were scrutinized, but eventually we agreed with them because the data was difficult to sort of ignore. And right. by the way, it's to our advantage because now we can launch a, a rocket that will reach Mars. If we thought that Mars moves around the Earth, we would shoot it in the wrong direction. Okay, so we understand what is going on in the sky, and that's to our advantage. The Earth is not at the center, okay? So this is an example. And insisting that we are the only intelligent species that ever existed since the Big Bang, in my, in, in my mind, is, is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it's also arrogant, the way you know, the, the first claim went. I can understand where it's coming from, because I had two daughters that you know, were young. They knew very little. They grew up at home, and they thought the world centers on them. So the lack of information is usually allowing you to feel important because you just think, I mean, the parents look at you, they feed you, everyone is looking around to to make sure that you are fine. So you are at the center of the universe. That was their world model. And then, obviously, they they had a psychological shock on the first day in the kindergarten. And we, as a civilization, we didn't mature yet. Because maturing me- means that it's not about us. We keep thinking that it's all about us. If there is a gadget from another civilization coming close to Earth, it's because they thought about spying on us. It's because they're predators. It's, no, it's not, we are not, you know, we, we kept listening for 73 years for radio signals. Uh, Se- SETI, SETI, the yeah. Search for Extraterrestrial SETI. Intelligence, and, which, which to me is like trying to, co- it's the cosmic equivalent of trying to contact a teenager by sending smoke signals. <laughs> well, that's one way to think of it. I think if it, uh, in a different way, the way I described it in my TED talk uh, last month in Vancouver, it didn't come out yet, but it will soon. Um, I, you know, it's just like waiting for a phone call right. uh, at home. And, Nobody may call you when you are listening because they don't know that you're lonely. And in fact, they may be, you know, they may be uh, um, hooked to their digital screens, uh, addicted, and just the way we are. So they might not care about us being lonely. They might not say, and sending radio signals obviously um, allows uh, others to know where you are, so it's not necessarily to your advantage to do that. And yeah. So there are many reasons why radio signals are not the, the thing we need to, to search for. What I'm suggesting is looking for objects in your backyard, that, yes. you know, sort of like space trash, because uh, you know, Elon Musk launched a Tesla Roadster car uh, in 2018, you know, a SpaceX used it as a dummy payload, and it's now on an elliptic orbit. And in 20 uh, million years or so, it has a 20% chance of colliding with Earth. Uh, And uh, uh, obviously, it will appear as a meteor of some unusual material strength. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you were to search the impact site, you might find the engine or or some piece of hardware because it it was made of uh, very strong steel uh, and uh, not from a rocky material. So all I'm saying is let's check all the meteors, you know, let's uh, mm-hmm. see if any of them is space trash, those that came into the solar system from outside. Maybe Elon is not the most accomplished entrepreneur since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. There are lots of cars out there. Uh, by the way, we can't see that car with our best telescope. It, it, it doesn't reflect enough sunlight. So the mm-hmm. only way to see it is if it collides with Earth when it comes very close and uh, we could see the fireball. Um, and you know, we've seen two interstellar meteors and, and realized that they were tougher than all the other space rocks that were ever cataloged by NASA. That, that's the, 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 the reason that I um, led an expedition to, to look for the materials of one of them. And that's uh, I Am One, uh, Papua I am one, New Guinea? From 2014, a, a decade ago. And it was actually moving faster than 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun, based on the U.S. Space Command data. And uh, it exploded only in the lower atmosphere, uh, about about, uh, 20 kilometers over the Pacific Ocean. And just to set the stage, you know, uh, there was a meteor over Spain and Portugal this week. And uh, that meteor was moving roughly at the same speed as IM-1, the interstellar meteor, relative to Earth. So I received a lot of emails, people asking me, was that interstellar as well, this meteor over Spain? And... Uh, 
And I explained that, um, in, in fact, I wrote an essay about it last night uh, on medium.com. That's where I put my essays. Um, explaining that um, this uh, for, uh, speed of uh, about 40 kilometers per second, which is almost a thousand times larger than the speed limit in a highway, um, that very high speed was a result that it came head on. So the Earth is moving around the sun and you know, it's uh, just like in a, uh, you know, the most uh, impactful car crashes are those that where people uh, cross lanes and you collide with a car on, in, in the opposite lane and, and, and that makes the relative speed of the two cars very high. And so in the same way, when the earth moves around the sun, it collides every now and then with a rock that belongs to the solar system. In this case, it's a piece of a comet that came from Jupiter, a family of comets near Jupiter. And it just came by chance in the opposite direction to the motion of the earth. And as a result, it had a very high speed of impact. On the other hand, I am one, the interstellar meteor had the same speed, but it came from behind the earth. And therefore, if it were to move opposite to the direction of the Earth, it would move at around 90 kilometers per second. So it was moving 40 because it, it went uh, from behind the Earth. And, um, and in difference, it explored at 20 kilometers above the Pacific Ocean instead of 70 kilometers um, above uh, Spain, where this uh, meteor exploded. And, and the atmosphere is... Uh, a thousand times more rarefied. Uh, the density of air is a thousand times less at 70 kilometers compared to 20 kilometers. So that means that this meteor over Spain was very fragile, be much, had much weaker material strength because it disintegrated very high up where the stress on it was a thousand times smaller than the stress uh, on the IM1 meteor, the interstellar meteor, when it exploded uh, in the dense atmosphere uh, uh, at 20 kilometers uh, altitude. So, so that means that IM1 was not only moving very fast, even faster than the stars near the sun, it was also made of materials that were much tougher uh, than typical rocks or comets. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we wanted to check. We went to the Pacific Ocean to check what it was made of. Why would that be controversial? I ask you to check materials uh, of whatever this meteor was made of. We went there and uh, I was told, don't go there, you will not find anything. We don't believe the US government. I believe the US government because they issued a letter from the US Space Command to NASA where they double checked the data, and they confirmed that this object was interstellar. So we went to where the error box of the Department of Defense found the, um, the fireball, okay? And we surveyed that uh, region 26 times, back and forth, with a magnetic sled, basically a sled covered with magnets that we placed on the ocean floor and uh, sort of like mowing the lawn. We, we went, went back and forth across that error box, and as, you know, we collected materials and we found 850 molten droplets in that region, out of which 10% included a chemical composition that was never reported in the scientific literature that is very different from solar system materials. And we had a very extensive paper that we submitted for peer review a few months ago uh, in a prestigious journal it took us nine months to analyze the materials with the best instruments in the world. And, um, you know, in the, the uh, three laboratories, uh, one of uh, Professor Stein Jacobson at Harvard University, another one of uh, Dr. Ryan Weed at UC Berkeley, and a third one uh, of uh, Dr. Roald Tagel at the Brooker Corporation in Germany, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bottom line is we found materials that are very unusual, that have up to a thousand times more uranium, for example, and hundreds of times more beryllium and lanthanum uh, than solar system materials, so we call it Belau composition. This paper, you know, we received uh, the referee reports. They did not say yikes, 
they said it's very interesting and they asked some questions and we uh, answered those questions uh, hopefully to their satisfaction. So this is the way science is done by attending to evidence uh, and then uh, analyzing uh, what it means. And I actually also wrote a paper after that suggesting a way of producing uh, the properties of this object uh, naturally near uh, the most common type of stars. And, um, and that was also peer-reviewed and accepted for publication. Now, what did a group of scientists do when we did all of that? And by the way, it took two years, one year of planning the expedition, getting one and a half million dollars from a donation to do it, right. and then analyzing the materials. You know, that was a, a huge amount of work. Just in the ocean, when I was on the deck of the ship uh, that was fittingly called Silver Star, you know, I, I, I didn't sleep much because, uh, you know, night and day we would bring back the sled and we had to... Uh, scoop the material from it and so I was we were very dedicated to the success of the mission and while we were there some of our critics said that you know they will not find anything we don't believe the US government on the day that I came back with the materials there was a paper published in the astrophysical journal the most prestigious astrophysics journal saying the government is often wrong therefore this meteor could have been from the solar system. And in that case, the measurements of the speed of this object relative to Earth were wrong by a factor of three. So we're not talking about small corrections. They're saying the US Space Command doesn't really know what they're doing by a factor of three. Right. Just think about it. If a ballistic missile is heading to Washington, D.C., they might say it's going to Mexico or uh, I don't know where. Um, so for them to publish in the scientific literature, a statement that basically ridicules a, a government organization which uh, is very I, dedicated I, to its, and, and actually I've issued a letter. I found that really surprising. Anyway, we came with the materials. Those scientists could have just said, let's wait and see. You know, Why would you publish a paper saying that this expedition should not have happened when we already came back with the materials? Yeah. What is the problem? So then anyway, while we were analyzing the materials, there was a paper published by another scientist who doesn't really work on meteoritic materials, but nevertheless, he made the claim that based on you know, what was known at the time, that in fact, what we found is coal ash. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that, of course, was publicized by newspapers. And actually, there was another scientist who made a big uh, statement about that and, and there was a blogger who said, oh yeah, this is space, you know, this is just uh, human made uh, uh, coal ash and that's ridiculous what they are claiming to have found materials that came from the meteor. They didn't really find the materials from the meteor, they found coal ash. So we looked at 55 elements from the periodic table, analyzed them for coal ash versus the material that we think is unique, uh, Belau spherules. And uh, we demonstrated that, you know, in, uh, for many of the elements, there, there are differences by more than an order of magnitude, one, by a factor of 10 to 100. So mm. it's not collage. Mm. And then, wait, that's not the end of the story. Then, uh, just a few months ago, when we just submitted our paper uh, with the results, there was another paper immediately around the same time put out saying, this meteor was actually a truck. And, and that was in the New York Times. And it was in the New York Times. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt Richtel reported about it. Now, the argument was that we uh, used primarily the error box of the Department of Defense to define the location of the meteor fireball. But we also, a few months before we went there, we checked if there are any seismometers in the region. And we found one that is in Manus Island, Papua New Guinea. And we asked, was there any blip in that seismometer that could have been related to the explosion? And we found a blip, and it was consistent with the time delay that you expect for sound waves from the explosion. But that, obviously, from one seismometer, you can't really tell the direction. You only know a time delay, and you can't really define the search area based on that. So we actually surveyed most of the box of the of the Department of Defense. We, we did not rely on this. Nevertheless, those people said, 
we don't believe the U.S. government. Therefore, we dismiss everything the U.S. government said, except for the fact that the meteor existed. That we accept. But so the location, convenient. we don't... Have, uh, uh, so then, if we just use, first of all, the meteor blip uh, in the seismometer data could have been a track nearby. So it has nothing to do with this explosion. And secondly, when we look at, at all the publicly available data on, uh, from seismometers or from uh, you know, uh, infrasound, then we get a very large error ellipse that includes the, the Department of Defense error box. It, it sits in the middle of, you know, in, in, in that region, but it's much bigger. So they say, oh, it's much bigger. They may have gone to the wrong place. And I say, of course it's much bigger because if you ignore the main source of data, then you would not know where it's located, but it's consistent with the Department of So you can't, how can you argue against the Department of Defense error box if your larger error ellipse includes it? And that's what they did. And then they talk to the New York Times and say, oh, the meteor was a truck because this seismometer could have been just a passing truck. And they didn't know what they are doing because the error ellipse that we find is much bigger. So they went to a particular region, but in fact, it could have been somewhere else, much bigger region. And I say, of course, if you ignore the main source of data, then you can't really. But it's not as if they ruled out the Department of Defense error box. Their error ellipse included the small error ellipse that we relied on. So you can't really rule out that uh, error ellipse from the Department of Defense. And how, why would you accept that the meteor actually existed? How can you be selective in what you accept from the US government? You know, right, and, and, right. and that to me is really dishonest. It, but the fact is. that Matt Richter from the New York Times didn't approach me to ask for the full story. Wow. So I wrote afterwards a, a note that explains uh, what was the logic behind us going to this particular region based on the US government data and gave all the information there. Uh, and when I submitted it as a research note, the editor who is friends with that group said, okay, well, there is nothing new in your research note. You know, it doesn't need to be publicized. Uh, and the reporters, of course, didn't do anything. And, and the New York Times kept it online. And I say, if that's the way a science reporter like Ma Matt Richter deals with a report about science, you know, how can I believe what the New York Times says about politics? You know, he had a narrative. He wanted to right. entertain the public without attending to the evidence. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been my issue about the, the UAP, about the whole phenomenon, is that there's an absence of logic that I'm seeing. I'm seeing right. denigration of fighter pilots. I'm seeing just ignoring evidence or counting evidence ab above others. And, and you just said it right there, is they're, they're cherry-picking what evidence they like well, to I'm see from the Well, I'm not talking about UAPs here. I'm talking about... And that's not, and exactly. I'm talking about the objects from the sky that are meteors or, right. uh, you know, and... and uh, this is uh, within the realm of uh, astronomy. So, you know, if you dismiss data that doesn't conform to, you, to your prejudice, you're not doing science. Yeah. Okay? So, at any event, um, you know, I'm doing my best, but I'm not just trying here to explain why saying yikes makes no sense. Yeah. And actually following science is the brave thing to do. And you might think right. that being curious, attending to data should be, you know, the narrative that science is led by, but it's not. And I always say in my interviews that science is better than politics. And the reason is that it relies on evidence. Right. But some people bring politics into science. And some science reporters do not distinguish between having an opinion and attending to evidence, right. which makes the difference between politics and science. Right. And I'm trying to explain that, but to me, the, the lack of uh, attention among scientists to anomalies, you know, is actually uh, suppressing innovation yeah. in science. It's troubling. It's really it's troubling, troubling. Because we should uh, just be agnostic and, and collect data. But when you have an opinion to start with, you know, it, it, it reminds me of the experience I had as a kid when I would ask a difficult question at the dinner table and the adults in the room would dismiss it because they didn't know the answer and right. they wanted to just move on and not show any weakness of not knowing uh, the answer. So they, 
they would either invent an answer or ignore the subject altogether. And I thought that by becoming a scientist, you know, I can actually find the answer myself. And that's what I'm doing. But I see a lot of adults in the room that are not, uh, that call themselves scientists, but are not really curious. Yeah. And uh, um, getting a little closer to Earth, you talked about, uh, at least in the near-Earth atmosphere and the troposphere, there aren't any observatories no. currently in existence that are actually surveying what's within 30,000, 40,000 feet. Well, so, so, Why is that? Well, uh, again, it's prejudice. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Elon Musk uh, uh, tweeted that, uh, or, or gave a speech in which he said that uh, within... Uh, you know, the 6,000 uh, uh, communication satellites uh, that uh, Starlink uh, right. has. Uh, um, you know, there was no incident where any of these satellites collided with a UFO or an unidentified object. Yeah. And I did a simple calculation. As, as soon as I heard about it, I said, okay, suppose you have an object the uh, size of a meter, size of a person, okay? What's the chance? And, and you put it actually at the altitude of 550 kilometers where the communication satellites are. Um, what's the chance that it will collide with one of them? It turns out that uh, such a collision will, t uh, will require a thousand years. You have to wait a thousand yeah. years. Um, and that's if you are roughly at the same altitude. If if the object is at a much lower altitude than 550 kilometers, why would it be at 550? I mean, it could be much like at, at 10 kilometers. Um, obviously, it will not collide even in 1,000 years with any of these. Yeah. So that's not a good argument. Uh, uh, and uh, It's not this, really answering the question either no, on and, and, his and, behalf. And, uh, it's a little bit of a dodge, too. But I should say, <laughs> um, so in order to see such objects, you really need an observatory that is geared for that. And that was never constructed by astronomers. But I should say there is progress because this week I wrote uh, an essay about uh, Dyson spheres. These are mega structures that may exist around other stars. And there was a recent study finding some anomalies near um, seven stars that may share the expected uh, infrared emission from these Dyson spheres. So Freeman yeah. Dyson imagined that very advanced civilizations would build a megastructure like a sphere around their host star so that they can harvest the energy output of the star. Because, you know, if you think about clean energy, we are at best harvesting the energy that impacts the Earth uh, from the sun. But if you, want, if you were more um, greedy, you would actually want to not to lose the rest of the energy the sun emits and build something around it. Uh, and so um, that's what Dyson was thinking about. And so I wrote an essay about it. I also wrote a paper saying that perhaps broken pieces of old Dyson spheres, you know, they would, they would suffer damage from uh, asteroids colliding with them. And I calculated that within a billion years, you know, they wouldn't be uh, able to maintain themselves because they would have so many fractures and collisions. And so at any event, uh, pieces from those could be floating in interstellar space between the... St and perhaps, you know, we've seen one of them in the form of uh, Oumuamua. This was a, a football-sized object uh, that was very peculiar, discovered in 2017 by astronomers uh, on Mount Haleakala, where the Pan-Stars Observatory noticed a near-Earth object that was interstellar, moving too fast to be bound to the sun. And it came within 100 million miles of the Earth? Um, yeah, about a sixth of the Earth-Sun separation. Uh, so, um, um, so then, um, as the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that's much more than the variation you see for rocks. Uh, so it meant that the object has an extreme shape. And when people tried to fit the variation of light, the best fit was that of a pancake, uh, a flat object. And um, then the object showed the excess push away from the sun. It wasn't clear what is pushing it because there was no cometary evaporation, no dust or gas seen around it. And so I suggested it's just a reflection of sunlight that is pushing it. And actually, uh, three years later, there was uh, another object observed uh, to be pushed away from the sun. And th this time it was clear that it's sunlight pushing it and there was no cometary tail. 
And this one uh, ended up uh, being called 2020 SO. There is a Wikipedia page about it. Okay. It ended up being a rocket booster that NASA launched in 1966. Wow. And so it's just space trash that we produced. And it had thin <coughs> walls, and that's why sunlight could push it. So, uh, you know, I just say, well, maybe there is other s space trash, and maybe it's a, uh, the pieces of a broken Dyson sphere, you know, they would be thin and could be pushed by reflecting sunlight. So anyway, that's uh, an example, and I, I wrote an essay about Dyson spheres mentioning these things, and then uh, within a day, Elon Musk uh, tweeted about Dyson spheres. So perhaps he's reading my <laughs> essays. Uh, if not your uh, astronomer friends, uh, maybe, that, uh, maybe others are. So I, I wanted to talk about what I'm calling the 124 light year divide in that the um, James Webb Space Telescope has, there's this uh, planet K218b, which yes. is a low probability of biosignatures mm -hmm. that may suggest life. So that's where modern astronomy is right now. Right. Here on terrestrial Earth, we have um, you know, the so-called UAP whistleblower David Grush. We've had many F-18 fighter pilots on both coasts of the United States that have said that these um, UAP are near daily uh, occurrence. Um, as you know, Ryan Graves off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah, he the, was in this room with, oh, wow. with me, actually, on a, his podcast. And, you know, a, the cube within a sphere, the yeah. so-called Tic Tac with uh, Commander David David Fravor, yeah. and you have very high-level folks in our government, um, of course, Senator Schumer, the United States Senate Majority Leader, his uh, mentor, uh, the late Senator Harry Reid, also mm -hmm. the United States Senate Majority Leader, um, who has said and was on recording in The New Yorker saying that I was told for decades that Lockheed Martin had these things in their possession, and I tried to gain access to it, and I was mm -hmm. denied. Yeah. Um, what do what, I make of it? What, what, yeah. what do you make of it? So, first of all, about uh, the planet that the Webb Telescope uh, took uh, sort of a very crude spectrum of, um, the claim was that there is a hint of a molecule called dimethyl uh, sulfide, uh, which on, on Earth is uh, produced by life, okay, right. and uh, in oceans. Um, um, and um, uh, first of all, the, the bump that was seen in the spectrum was very insignificant. If you look at the spectrum, it's, there are really many other bumps uh, nearby. And there was a recent paper a few weeks ago claiming that this particular spectral bump uh, might have been associated with methane or some other molecule. So not only the, the signal is not very significant relative to the noise, but also it could have been something else. And that will always be the case with um, molecular fingerprints in spectra. So the mainstream of the astronomy community decided as a high priority to build the next generation of telescopes that would cost perhaps tens of billions of dollars in search for what is called biosignatures, which are the molecular fingerprints in the atmospheres of planets that you can find by looking at planets that cross the face of their star so that light from the star is passing through their atmosphere and then there is some absorption by various molecules in the atmosphere that tells you uh, the composition of the atmosphere. So if you have oxygen, methane, uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide, you know, it sounds familiar. It may be related to life. But the problem is many of these molecules could be produced by natural processes, geological or chemical, and people will debate forever whether it's uh, really microbes. Now, you may ask, why is the astronomy community willing to put all of their chips on this approach? And the answer you will hear very often is, well, because when Earth cooled four billion years ago, the first things that existed were microbes, okay? And by the way, the Earth atmosphere, one thing that is omitted very often is the Earth atmosphere until two billion years ago did not have much, much oxygen in it. Uh, that oxygen had a surge uh, as a result of 
cyanobacteria uh, that uh, produce the oxygen on Earth and fill the, the oceans and, and, and the atmosphere with oxygen, uh, in a very sudden event that is not fully understood, you know, I always wonder if that was triggered by something brought to Earth from outside, like a big rock that came from far away, maybe that triggered that uh, effect, and, or maybe a visit you know, a, of a gardener that seeded the Earth with cyanobacteria or something. I mean, they, cyanobacteria existed beforehand, but why was there a sudden rise in the oxygen level in the big oxidization uh, event, oxidation event? Um, and so, um, you know, the, this f approach of looking for uh, molecular fingerprints will uh, is... Uh, rationalized by saying microbes are probably everywhere because Earth had them very early on and intelligent life arrived relatively late so maybe it's extremely rare and it doesn't exist anywhere but my point is that you need to weigh in the evidence that you can get so uh, these molecular fingerprints are dubious uh, they are very subtle uh, difficult to detect and then difficult to interpret. But right. if you find a gadget that was technologically produced, or if you find, even in terms of molecular fingerprints, if you find industrial pollution in the atmospheres of habitable planets, you know, it will demonstrate, I mean, these molecules that we have in our atmosphere that are produced by refrigerating systems, uh, the CFCs, you know, they cannot be produced by nature. They are a product of technology. And um, if we find them on another planet, it will show that not only life exists there, but intelligent life. So yeah. in that sense, it will not be debatable uh, if we find a technological signature beyond a reasonable doubt. And so my point is, we have to hedge our bets. We don't know what would be easier to detect. It might, you know, primitive life, microbes might be everywhere. But if you find a gadget, then you know that it cannot be anything else other than an intelligent species that made it. So my point is we have to take that into account and in order to maximize our chances of success, we need to invest in both approaches, searching for technological signatures as well as biological signatures. That's controversial in the minds of the person who said, yikes. Now, if we ask why is the US government talking about it, it's because the scientific community is not dealing with it. Uh, and yet military personnel see things that they don't understand. These are reliable people. You know, these are people. I mean, they're trust. trained observers. That's, yeah. that's their job. So, but they're not scientists. Right. So the whole idea of the Galileo project that I'm leading is to bring this subject to the realm of science, where you know, we built a new observatory, at ha first at Harvard University, monitoring the sky. We've looked already over recent months in half a million objects in the sky with infrared, optical, radio, and audio sensors. At, at what distance? We can see, well, it's basically up to the atmosphere how far we can see, but uh, satellites we see, uh, there are if they are bright enough. Uh, but um, typically airplanes or drones, we can see to a distance of um, a few kilometers. Okay. Uh, and these are, these, these are near Earth observations. Yeah, near Earth. And okay. the question is, are there any objects that are anomalous, that are not birds, uh, airplanes, balloons, drones, and so forth? And we have uh, developed machine learning uh, software that will help us in the classification. And this is one observatory near Boston. And we haven't found anything anomalous as of yet. Okay. We're writing now a paper summarizing the first runs that we made. Uh, you know, probably it will be up to a million objects that we looked at. The U.S. government, of course, if they write a report to the Congress that says we identify 97% of the object, of, of all these anomalous uh, objects, um, UAPs, uh, they might be happy about it because they minimize the chance that Russia or China are responsible for those. Uh, 
but from a scientific perspective, you know, and that's, by the way, the, the report that the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office in the Pentagon right. delivered. I, known as Arrow. Yeah. So my point is, from a scientific perspective, even finding one object in a billion would be very important news. Huge deal. Yeah. yeah. So we know that it's a mixed bag. We know that lots of human-made objects in the sky and lots of natural objects. And we just need to find the anomalous ones. And... Of course, we, we shouldn't task the government to find them for us because the government is engaged in national security. That's right. the day That's job. Right. Anything that comes from outside the solar system is my day job. Yeah. So, so that's what... Now, we are building, actually, another observatory in Colorado right now that right. Um, will observe the sky from another location. And we received a grant uh, a month ago from the Richard King Mellon Foundation for $575,000 right. to build a third observatory uh, in Pennsylvania. So hopefully within a year, we'll have three functioning observatories looking wow. at the entire sky. And my hope is that the number of such observatories will increase tenfold. Uh, for that, of course, we need funding. But it's just at the level of five to ten million dollars for us to build a, a whole array of such observatories and we might get to a billion objects that we monitored and we could tell you if there is anything anomalous out there it's not just a matter of serving the sky but also how much time you allocate to look at the sky and there was no experiment whatsoever before the Galileo project Ever. observatories that monitor the sky systematically. The reports you have from military personnel is because they happen to be at the right place at the right time. This is anecdotal report. Yeah. And the, the advantage of a systematic study of the sky all the time is that you know the background. You monitor what is common in the sky, and then if something anomalous shows up, you know how rare it is. And that's what we are doing. And there was never an experiment that monitored the entire sky for periods of months. And we have the first results from that. So I'm very proud, you know, it's carving new territory of data collection. And once again, why would anyone have a problem with data right. collection? If you, if you don't find anything, you don't find anything. No, if but we don't, we will yeah. say that. And that's yeah. actually what we yeah. are now writing a paper saying, you know, out of the half a million objects, you know, we didn't see anything anomalous. Right. I mean, what's the problem with yeah. that? As long as it's being conducted in good faith. Uh, yeah. yeah. But I if, mean, we cannot... In, we cannot invent uh, things. Uh, we will just report what we are seeing. Right. Yeah. There, I guess my, my question is, okay. We, oh, and, and by the way, I should yeah. say one more thing. Please. There is, there is a whole culture of believers in oh, UAPs. Yes. Oh, yes. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, some of them resemble religious cults. Right. Um, and um, because they just believe, they know it, they know the answer, they don't need to look for more data. Yeah. And, um, you know, I often say that um, we work the same way that FIFA, the soccer organization, right. works. And if there is a, a disputed goal in a soccer match, you know, FIFA doesn't go around to the players or the audience and asks, what do you think about it? You were eyewitnessing this thing, and what do you think about it? That's not the way to figure out if there was a goal. Uh, because we all know that in car accidents, there are people who attend the same event that provide very different reports. Yeah. So we cannot rely on people. Eyewitnesses you know, are not reliable. And um, therefore, FIFA is using cameras. That's what the Galileo Project is doing. So we're doing what common sense says we need to yeah. do. Uh, you know, humans are not reliable detectors. Now, you might say, oh, well, in the courtroom, uh, people are put in jail as a result of uh, eyewitness testimonies. Sure. Well, but also in the courtroom, very often, you know, we hear about cases that were judged uh, incorrectly. When the DNA test uh, comes along, they realize the person is innocent. You know? Yeah, I mean, eyewitness testimony is long known to not be reliable. Right. I mean, here's my thing. We're, we're collecting data and we're collecting data but we have people, I mean, you've got folks that you've worked with, Gary Nolan, for instance, who had said he is 100% certain um, that we have these reverse engineered technologies, and he was two weeks away from visiting it, and he was denied access. Okay. So, you know, it's almost like you're searching for a body, uh, for instance, and you see the footprints in the snow, 
And if you find the body, you don't really care about the footprints right. in the snow anymore. I mean, it would save me decades if the government has data, materials, information, if they were to release it or share it with me, I would be happy and know the answer, but they haven't. And I haven't seen, I, I'm not an experiencer. Yeah. Nolan says that as a young kid, he experienced right, something. Right, in the age of 12. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't experience anything. Neither have I. Okay. So, and, you know, I... I want to use the scientific method to figure it out. I'm just curious. That's yeah. all. So the way to think of me is like a curious kid. You know, I'm just, I just want to figure it out. And, you know, so you have people on both sides uh, being very vocal. You have uh, believers who, you know, know the answer and don't need you to search for evidence and want to educate you about the <laughs> ideas that have no... Um, you know, data to support them. Yeah. And uh, on the other side, you have scientists who say, we don't want to sleep in the same bed with those other... And to me, it looks just like political polarization where you have the extreme left and oh, the extreme exactly. right yeah. making outrageous claims and do not, not speaking to each other. And actually being in the middle and doing what sounds like common sense is rare and difficult because it you is. get attacked from both sides. You do. Yeah, I'm a, myself, I'm a, a centrist and I'm one of the, and, I, and in America today, I'm a weirdo because, you know, the, the socialists call me a Trump supporter and the Trump supporters <laughs> call me a socialist. Well, so you please nobody. You, it's you a badge of honor. <laughs> I think so. But I think the, so. But the... I found that uh, common sense is not common no. in academia. No, and uh, anyway, actually, really. I just wrote an essay this week. Another one, I wrote six of them in one week. Uh, another week. one that uh, talked about uh, my my feeling that I am. I feel like I'm an uh, extremophile in a very acidic um, academic environment. Yeah. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that uh, scholarship is being threatened in academia. And I actually spoke, uh, there was a faculty meeting with Harvard's corporation. That's the governing, governing body of Harvard University. A, a couple of months before that, I spoke with the interim president of Harvard and provided him with my opinions, eight uh, bullet points that I thought will bring Harvard uh, to a better place because of all the turmoil that happened right. recently where yeah. the president sp stepped down and so forth. But... With the corporation, I basically spoke and said, um, what are the main two threats to s scholarship in academia? And I gave the answer. One of them is bringing politics to campus, which is what you see nowadays when uh, campuses are adopting a political narrative that belongs to one extreme of the political map. And I don't care which side of the political map it resides in. The problem is that it alienates members of the community, students and, and, and faculty, who do not agree necessarily with those principles. And it creates a, an environment that resembles 1984, uh, the book by uh, George Ooh. Orwell. Right. And I feel it also in terms of the science that I'm doing, because one of the uh, mottos of uh, the party, the slogans th that were mentioned in the book, 1984, was ignorance is strength. And in the context of my research, you know, what could be clearer uh, than saying the data is wrong and there shouldn't be any, you know, the meteor was a truck and we shouldn't have gone there and what you found is coal ash. Basically, this group of people is saying, searching for materials, looking for evidence, believing data that is provided publicly on the NASA website is not good for us. Ignorance is strength. Let's ignore data that we don't like and ridicule those who try to get more data related to that. And to me, that's a very troubling Situation because I think it suppresses innovation in academia. Sure. It's not just me. It's not just this subject. But the second thing, aside from, you know, and, and I call that putting politics into science, where political narratives control science. The second thing that uh, uh, is a risk to scholarship is uh, bureaucracy. And uh, when I came to Harvard 40 years ago, 
Sorry, let, let, let's uh, start it again. Can you cut it out? Yeah, no okay. problem, no problem. The second uh, risk to uh, scholarship is bureaucracy. When I came to at Harvard uh, 31 years ago, uh, there was a direct line between a faculty member and the leading administration. Um, and uh, now there are layers of mini deans and a lot of administrators who pursue specific mini tasks. And, um, you know, just like the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which says that entropy only increases in time, bureaucracy, I mean, that's the, <laughs> yeah. the, the first law of governance, that bureaucracy only increases in time because right. bureaucrats uh, create new rules and then they, re- they need more bureaucrats to maintain these rules, to attend to them, to enforce them. Right. And that increases the ratio of uh, administrators to faculty, which is the current situation. And then you lose the narrative. Instead of the administration promoting ex- excellence in scholarship and trying to um, cultivate um, uh, uh, open and free speech, they uh, uh, think that they are in charge, you know, rather than serve the, the scholars. And uh, I see that as a big risk. Uh, and I mentioned it to the corporation. Of course, I didn't expect them to embrace it. I didn't expect the deans to embrace it because they are part of the system. But, yeah. but uh, I'm not optimistic. The future will not be better because, uh, as I said, the bureaucracy will only increase. And those uh, members of the, of the academic community that were selected uh, by a system that went to one side of the political spectrum you know, they will... They Select s- people like themselves. Like themselves, yeah. and they would maintain the system. So I don't think it will change. Yeah. But the, the, so what we learn from biology is that in order to survive, you need to adapt. And there are these extremophiles that, uh, that uh, flourish in uh, acidic environments. So that's uh, my lesson. I just need to learn how to survive in it. Right, yeah. yeah it's, uh, and, and you've been tenured since 1996, at Harvard. Yes. Wow. Okay. And so it's changed quite a bit in that time and it, it got bigger. And yeah. I, you know, I'm very naive um, uh, in terms of uh, believing in, in, in principles that used to be um, uh, appreciated in the past and I think they should always be. But the world is changing and um, at this point, if I was offered a ticket, a one-way ticket to space, I would take it. Uh, even if I wouldn't survive for very long out there, it would be a new experience. And, uh, you know, my wife said uh, 10 years ago, she said, okay, if a spaceship lands in, your, in our backyard, I want you to ask them two things. Uh, first, not to ruin the loan when they lift <laughs> off and take you with them, but also make sure that you leave the car keys with, with me uh, so that you don't take it uh, to the, for the trips. She wouldn't be able to use the car. Um, but uh, I asked her again a year ago, and, and this time she said she will join me. Wow. So, um, so in a way, you know, I'm a bit frustrated by how non-intelligently we, ha- we are behaving. Because if you read the news every day, you know, you see reports about conflicts. And uh, we invest $4 trillion a year in military budgets. You know, each of us lives for less than 120 years. And it's a very short time. This is just one part in 100 million of the age of the universe. And yet we insist on making it even shorter by killing each other, by taking risks on just, for example, zero-sum games, uh, territorial games. You know, there are two wars right now on territories. You know, these are just uh, the way we split the land on the rock, the tiny rock that was left over from the formation of the sun. (laughs) There is so much real estate in interstellar space if we just look up and the only hope i have is that we would change our perspective if we receive a letter in our mailbox if we find a package that that tells us that there is a better role model than our politicians out there some interstellar neighbor uh, that will uh, provide us with a better roadmap for a prosperous future you know we are all on the same boat uh, sailing through space, and we better work together. Yeah, you, you've said humanity needs a common ambition. 
Yeah, and, and, and uh, having someone from another star uh, will change our perspective because we know from our private life that having a partner changes the meaning of your existence. Yeah. And, you know, Enrico Fermi, uh, some 73 years ago, asked, where is everybody? Uh, but that's a question that every lonely person asks, every single person asks. And the answer is, you need to leave home at the very least. You know, obviously, you will have a better chance of finding someone if you go to a dating site. But at the very least, you should look through your windows. And we, you know, Enrico Fermi didn't search. He didn't build a Galileo-type observatory. He didn't go to expeditions to figure out if there are objects coming from outside the solar system that may be space trash uh, from another civilization. He didn't do that. So, you know, new knowledge does not fall into our lap. We have to put an effort to retrieve it. And people say very often, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence right. because Sagan. Carl Sagan right. emphasized it. I think it's wrong. I think uh, these people are not seeking the evidence and it will not fall into our lap. I think extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding and effort. And uh, we have to take responsibility for gaining this knowledge. It's a learning experience. We have to be open to finding someone else out there. Yeah, you've talked a lot about humanity, and you, you've said humanity has a history of struggling to acknowledge its limitations. Uh, we rarely allow our inescapably uh, obvious insignificance within the universe to intrude our habit of terrestrial navel gazing. Well, um, so I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote uh, that connects two things we discussed. Uh, I had the breakfast with a string theorist uh, a year ago, and um, and I asked him, uh, he's one of the most accomplished physicists, theoretical physicists uh, in the world, and I asked him, what is your most, what do you regard as your most important scientific paper? And he said, it's a paper about supersymmetry, which is a new symmetry of nature that was contemplated decades ago. And uh, I was surprised because I said the Large Hadron Collider, you know, that, that smashes particles at the highest energies that we can, and, uh, searched for this uh, supersymmetry and didn't find it in the natural parameter space where it was supposed to exist. And so why would you be proud of a paper that you wrote about an idea that was not confirmed by evidence and, in fact, maybe not a description of reality. Right. And he said, well, you know, if we just wait, maybe the next accelerator the, will smash particles at higher energies and then we will find it. He was not troubled at all by the lack of evidence. And I was reminded by the Jewish Orthodox community in Crown Heights in Brooklyn that... Um, had a theoretical model. It was not about uh, supersymmetry, but it was about their rabbi becoming the Messiah after he dies. So that was their theory, and then he died, and he didn't come back. So that was a data point, evidence. You might say, did they realize that their idea was wrong? And the answer is no. They said, we just have to wait very similar to the approach of the string theorist. So I ask you, is there a difference between what is regarded as mainstream in theoretical physics, a subject that your friend will never say yikes about, but would say, actually, let's wait, let's build, let's invest tens of billions of dollars in the next accelerator, and maybe we'll find this, compared to what I'm doing, searching for evidence, real evidence, about anomalies real anomalies that were reported in the literature and trying to figure them out by collecting more evidence. Okay, so on the one hand, you have ideas that are legitimate within the mainstream, but are highly speculative. And in fact, when we try to test them, they didn't come to fruition, in which people continue to believe. Right. And those critics who have a problem with searching for intelligent civilizations out there, have no problem with string theories working on supersymmetry right now and being proud of supersymmetry, <laughs> right. even though it was not found in the laboratory. Right. 
And moreover, they are actually celebrating by giving awards and, and honors to those people right. who do intellectual gymnastics just to impress their peers. And it's regarded as a fair game. And I ask, did we lose our common sense? Uh, you know, did we really lose a sense of direction in physics where, you know, we know that a substantial fraction of all the sun-like stars may have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. There are hundreds of billions of them in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And if we apply the Copernican principle, we would conclude that the next Copernican revolution might be that uh, we, we are not at the intellectual center of the universe. And that's, that was what I described in my talk in Poland. Uh, that to me sounds like common sense. And why would that be regarded as a controversial idea I mean, that question. something like us exists somewhere else when, where the conditions were replicated and not only once, but they were replicated hundreds of billions of times in the Milky Way galaxy alone, not to speak about the fact that there are trillions of galaxies in the observable volume of the universe, not to speak about the fact that there is no evidence for an edge to the universe, even if you know, we know that beyond the cosmic horizon that we can see, there couldn't be an edge. It, it must, the conditions must extend at least 4,000 times beyond the cosmic horizon, because if there was a cliff, we would notice the effect, the gravitational effect of the cliff on the cosmic microwave background, the relic radiation from the Big Bang. So we know that you know, there are 4,000 cubed more galaxies than we can observe beyond the cosmic horizon. So you take a trillion galaxies that we can see times 4,000 cube, and you say in each of them, you might have hundreds of billions of stars. You know, that's plenty yeah, of opportunities. It's beyond human comprehension. <laughs> for us to claim there is no evidence, we shouldn't really, we don't have time to invest funds in this direction, let's just look for microbes. You know, I'm starting to suspect that maybe the reason we search for microbes is so that we can maintain our sense of superiority right. because it, it doesn't threaten our ego right. to find it's microbes. Safe. We can still feel that we are smart. You know, we put in menus of restaurants, we put animals on the menu that we are allow ourselves to eat just because they are less smart than we are. Yeah. You think about a chicken. Poor chicken, you know. We just think it's not intelligent enough, therefore we can eat it. The same about a cow and so forth. Right. I'm not, you know, I'm not a vegan uh, or, or vegetarian, but, but uh, my point is that, you know, we, we think... We are driven by the notion that there is nobody as smart as we are. And therefore, Elon Musk can say, I haven't seen any, anyone out there. Therefore, we have full responsibility for the entire universe. And therefore, we should go to Mars. And we, you know, we feel empowered. But I say we made that mistake already by saying that we are at the center of the universe. Why make it again in terms of saying we, there is nobody out there? Let's just look. I'm not saying they must be there, but I'm saying... Without searching, we will not find anything. And all I'm saying is, if you put $10 billion towards finding microbes, put $10 billion also towards finding intelligent right. yeah. uh, civilizations. Why? Because the public cares about it. And, you know, my colleagues very often in committees, funding uh, committees, they say, we, we don't want to take any risks because this is federal money and we don't want to waste taxpayers' money. And I say, did you ever ask the taxpayers what they care about? Right. Uh, do you, are you sure that they care about microbes as much as about <laughs> intelligent civilizations? And, 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 and if you were to ask the taxpayers, wouldn't they tell you to split the, to hedge your bets, to split the funding also in the direction that I'm exploring? Uh, so, you know, the, it's really a very strange situation right now. It is. And how do you suppose if there are other civilizations and if they were to have visited Earth at some point in the near or distant future, how would they have traveled the distance of Alpha Centauri is 4.2 light years? Away? And that's the closest. Yeah. So first I would say that, 
It takes less than a billion years to move from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other with the technology that we are using. Uh, Voyager will do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say, okay, one billion years is a long time. But the point is that, you know, most stars formed billions of years before the sun. So there was plenty of time for them to do it, for, for civilizations next to them, to do it if you started their technological clocks billions of years before you right. the, the universe is 10 billion years older than 13, the Earth. 13.8 well, versus 3.8. 13.8, and the sun formed 4.6 billion okay. years ago, so it's the last one-third of cosmic history, and most of the stars formed a few billion years before the sun. Okay. So there was enough time for a civilization like, like ours, you know, if you start the clock a few billion years ago, to have sent Voyager-like probes that would have been here, right now. Okay. Uh, so, but these are probably defunct uh, probes because Voyager will not be functional in a billion years. Um, however, if they had more than a century of science and technology, they could have developed probes that survive even for a billion years. I mean, that's possible. That's, for that, you don't need to be patient. You just need to send hardware that would survive the journey. So I'm not talking about biological creatures surviving the journey. I'm talking about AI astronauts, AI systems that are capable of uh, making decisions on their own, being autonomous. They are not uh, helicopter parented the way that uh, our gadgets so far have been, have been in space. You know, we've never sent an AI system to space. Uh, all the gadgets on, on Mars are being... Uh, uh, guided by engineers uh, at the Jet uh, Propulsion Lab in, in Pasadena. Right. And uh, I call that uh, helicopter parenting because, <laughs> in fact, we did uh, um, uh, operate the helicopter on Mars. And, um, but when you go large distances, it's not practical anymore because right. it takes light signals a long time to go back and forth so the probe cannot really wait for guidance. It's sort of like sending your kids out of home and you don't expect them to call you every time they have some, something uh, happening to them, but you expect them to inform you of the most important milestones. And so yeah. I think that's the wave of the future for space exploration for us, but it must have been also for previous civilizations far away that existed before us. They may not be around anymore, but the probes might be around. And... Um, of course, there are propul so our propulsion is based on um, chemical rockets. fuels or yeah. rockets, yeah. yeah. And they, those, since the time of Sputnik, they could not provide a speed higher than uh, one part in 10,000 of the speed of light. Okay, so that's why it takes uh, half a billion years to cross the Milky Way from one side to the other, it takes 50,000 years to reach the nearest star, okay? Um, but there is still this opportunity of uh, making the spaceship uh, faster. And uh, I was actually, I led a, a project called the Starshot that uh, contemplated a, a method for reaching a fraction of the speed of light. And the idea was to build a, a membrane, a sail, uh, which is being pushed by light and uh, you know with a very powerful laser that uh, beams um, about 100 gigawatt over a few minutes on a sail the size of a person you can reach a fifth of the speed of light in a few minutes and oh. um, and such a sail would reach a distance that is five times the distance to the moon during that time but you basically launch it just like uh, you launch a bullet in a preferred direction. So if you send it towards the nearest star, it will get there in 20 years. Uh, Alpha Centauri, that has actually three stars in it. And Proxima Centauri, one of these stars in the nearest star system, uh, has a, a planet in the habitable zone. It's a dwarf star, and uh, so it's much fainter than the sun. But the, uh, the habitable region where liquid water may exist is 20 times closer than... Uh, the separation of the Earth from the Sun, and uh, there is there happen to be a planet there, and the question is, is it green? Is there vegetation on it? Is it blue? Is there other oceans on it? 
Or is it um, just like Mars, a desert, uh, like a planet that lost its uh, atmosphere because it's so close to the, to the dwarf star? And so one way to find out is by visiting its neighborhood. And, um, so, but this is a very ambitious uh, technological uh, method, and we haven't, of course, uh, developed it yet, but it's one way of reaching a fraction of the speed of light that saves a lot of time. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not in a rush. I think um, since uh, time in the universe is measured in billions of years, you know, um, I don't mind if it will take us a billion years to reach uh, the most uh, interesting destinations. You know, if I were, you know, I would never open, let's say, a, 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 an interstellar tourist agency, you know, like because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot promise my customers to make it in their lifetime. But I, I should give you an anecdote that if you were to, you know, according to Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity that describes gravity as curvature of space-time, um, so we are stuck on Earth and we feel comfortable. It's uh, an acceleration of 1G on the surface of the Earth. But if you were to board a, a, a rocket that uh, is accelerating at 1G, it would feel just like being on the surface of Earth. Uh, you would not be able to tell the difference between a gravitational acceleration of 1G and a rocket acceleration of 1G. There is no difference, according to Einstein, uh, theory of gravity. And so we would feel quite comfortable sitting in that rocket. It's as if we are sitting in this room, except imagine this room accelerating out of the atmosphere into space. You know, uh, And then if we do that for a year, we would reach very close to the speed of light. So 1G over times one year is roughly the speed of light. And if you do that for 20 years or so, you get extremely close to the speed of light. You can't uh, go faster than the speed of light, uh, according to Einstein's theory of special relativity. So, but you approach the speed of light, and time is ticking more slowly in the frame of reference of that spaceship relative to the rest of the universe, your friends that are left on Earth. So, in fact, you can make it uh, to billions of light years away from Earth. Because in your frame, it, only 20 years would pass, but you will actually make it to, you know, many billions of light years away. And, in fact, you can even return back to Earth at that time. The sun may have evolved by then, and uh, within a billion years, the sun will become brighter and uh, boil off all the oceans on Earth. We're and done. Nobody on Earth will stay. <laughs> We're done for. Exactly. So you will come back just, you know, let's say 20 years older and you would find nothing, no life on Earth. It's completely burned up. It would look similar to Mars, uh, like a desert. And you would see the sun much brighter, but um, none of your friends will be around. But you made a trip to, almost to the edge of the universe. So the only uh, ingredient here that we don't have is a rocket uh, ship that accelerates at 1G for 20 years. And you have talked about our limitations as humans, and you know we're not the smartest uh, uh, creature beings in the universe, a civilization. And you know Einstein, of course, is you know. Consider the, the the smartest human. Uh, I yeah, guess but he, he's not the smartest. Well, scientist. I mean, he's the smartest of the idiots in, in a yeah, way of yeah. us humans. Yeah. So, you know, you talked about the theory of relativity. I, it, is it? This sounds heretical, but maybe Einstein's wrong. Do, do, do you allow possible. for that? Of course, uh, it's all a matter of data. So far, we haven't uh, discovered a particle moving faster than light. We haven't uh, seen a violation, a clear violation of Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity that uh, gravity is a curvature of space-time. Now, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, data that supports um, in, uh, that theory, including uh, black You know, we have images of black holes, and the first one was um, uh, derived at um, the conference room of the Black Hole Initiative, for which uh, I served as the founding director at Harvard University. Right. Um, so uh, there is a lot of, I mean, there are people who dedicated decades of their career to finding deviations from Einstein's theory of uh, gravity, and they didn't, and they didn't. And so in some areas, uh, the precision reaches, you know, maybe 10 decimal points, and uh, 
it's still, you know, the theory works very wow. well. Um, so if there was a deviation that was a clear-cut deviation, then, of course, the Nobel Prize would be given to whoever finds it, and I, I would accept it instantly. So that, the point is there are no sacred ideas in, in, in science or in physics. Um, it's all up to the experiments, which are basically a learning experience where we test whether nature is described by the ideas that we have. And, yeah. you know, we might have the wrong ideas, as you said. So let me just give one example that, you know, we don't know what most of the universe is made of. And so um, 84% um, of uh, the matter in the universe is uh, made of a substance that uh, we don't know. Uh, and that's the matter that makes galaxies that, you know, is the most abundant stuff out there. We don't know what it is. And uh, almost uh, 90 years ago, it, it was realized that uh, uh, groups of galaxies and galaxies contain much more matter than we can actually see, the ordinary matter that we can see in the form of stars and so forth. Because uh, gravity is far stronger in these systems, then we can associate with the observable matter. And so Fritz Zwicky called it invisible matter. But there is another way to think of it. Maybe the way we describe gravity is wrong. That there is no other matter, but somehow we are using the wrong laws of gravity to describe what we are seeing. And that's always a possibility because we haven't yet found the dark matter. So... That's something that I'm always open about, and I wrote the scientific papers. Let me give you an example. If um, uh, the law of inertia was violated, uh, there is a very specific formulation of violating the law of inertia such that you know, there, there would be no need for dark matter. And I showed in a paper a couple of years ago that if that were the case, you could build a, a rocket uh, that doesn't need a lot of fuel. As long as it operates at very low accelerations, it can actually reach very high speeds uh, without having a lot of fuel. The, the reason that the, our rockets at high accelerations require a lot of fuel is because you know, the amount of mass that you need to bring in the fuel uh, grows exponentially as you want to increase the speed of the rocket beyond the exhaust speed. And that means that um, you, you just run out, of, I mean, you just cannot pack so much fuel in because you have to carry it with the rocket. But if you had a different law of inertia, it turns out that you can have a relatively small amount of fuel and as long as you operate at low accelerations, it will bring you to very high speeds. And uh, so... Um, so there could be practical implications for that, for space travel. And this is one example of um, the, low, the laws that we embrace that might be wrong. And another example is, in the context of gravity, we are familiar with positive masses. You know, like the mass of the Earth is positive, so mm -hmm. gravity is attractive. And all the masses that we recognize so far of objects are positive. And gravity is always attractive. Uh, but if you make the analogy with electromagnetism, you know, electric charges come in positive and negative uh, values. Right. And um, in electro electromagnetism, uh, a positive charge attracts a negative charge, but it repels a positive charge. Right. However, in gravity, a positive mass attracts a positive mass, and it will repel a negative mass. And so, in principle, you might say, okay, well, suppose there was, we had a, a way of engineering a matter in such a way that you would have a negative mass. What would be the implications? So then you can take a positive mass and a negative mass next to it. The negative mass will be uh, pushing away the, the positive mass, and the positive mass will be attracting the right. negative mass. So they would accelerate together like a pair and run away up to the speed of light. And uh, Hermann Bondi was a physicist who recognized this uh, 1957. But um, 
just uh, a month ago, I realized that this, um, if that were true, if there were negative masses, in fact, you could build a time machine. Wow. Because if, when you have a positive mass and you bring light uh, next to it, uh, so light is passing by it, uh, the light is delayed along its path because time is ticking more slowly close to the, to the positive mass. And moreover, space is curved in such a way that it takes more time for the light to traverse that distance. If you now change the mass to being negative, instead of delaying the light, you're advancing it. Okay. And what that means is that you can build a time machine where the light will return to the sender before it was sent. Okay. <laughs> so that means that you could visit your grandparents and kill them, and then there is a logical question. What happens to you? How is it possible that you exist? Right. And so most scientists believe, most physicists believe that time machines are not possible for that reason because you get into logical inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. So if you th say no time machines, in this paper that I'm writing now, I'm telling you now the, the abstract of this paper, we would say if you don't think that time machines exist, then there are no negative masses in the universe. Okay. So that is, I, I mean, it's a conundrum. And yeah, you just, there is no point in you investing effort. I mean, if you were to build, uh, I mean, of course, the, the other side is if you were able to engineer a negative mass, you could go back in time. But um, it's just, um, I mean, it, it, most physicists think that it's forbidden. You write in your autobiography that you had wanted to be a philosopher. Do you feel like your life has come full circle now? Yeah, it's not by chance. That's my nature. And yeah. the whole purpose of um, tenure in academia is so that you can pursue, you can go against the wind. Right. You know, and so I got an email uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, um, I'm the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at uh, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And we had a conference celebrating 20 years. And uh, a lot of our former postdoctoral fellows came and now they are leading astrophysicists in the most prestigious universities around the world. And I was very pleased to see them. And some yeah. of them told me that I had a huge influence on their yeah, career and wow. they thanked me. But um, as I was listening to the talks, you know, on the first day of the conference, I get an email. So I check it and it's from Neil deGrasse Tyson who says... Oh, that was just the morning where I finished my paper saying that perhaps the gravitational wave signal that was reported was just a result of the jitter of the sun as a result of asteroids in the main asteroid belt around it. So he said, it's nice to see that sometimes you write about a speculative idea and explain it in terms of a more mundane explanation, when, in the case of Oumuamua, you obviously went uh, the other way, and that's what you're doing most of the time now. So I wrote back to him and said, um, you know, I enjoy actually going against the wind. You should try it sometime. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. To which Neil did not respond. <laughs> So, I mean, what, what do you think it is about your nature that has made you interested, in, you know, seeking to go against the wind in a way that many others, most others in your field are, are, are not? Okay, well, I just don't care about the wind. Now, if I happen to go against the wind, uh, so be it. But if the wind is behind my back, I would be even happier. I, I'm just trying to do something that was not realized before because I want to, to make a contribution because basically, you know, we live for a short time. And if I, if I basically um, subscribe to the crowd and just do what everyone else is doing, I, 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 I would feel that I'm not making a contribution. Yeah, I mean, what's the point in what's some What's the respect? point? Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously it will give me a, a sense of self-importance because I, I will be doing what everyone else is doing and, 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 and gaining... Uh, better accolades, um, nobody would say yikes, and it would be great. <laughs> but on the other hand, I would get to the end of my life, and I would ask, um, could I have done it differently? Yeah. You know, and 
Um, you know, and the other thing is, just like in the words of uh, Frank Sinatra, if I can make it there, you know, I will make it anywhere, everywhere, yeah. anywhere. And uh, so going against the wind and, and being able to sustain the pushback, the bruises, means that I'm resilient. I don't have any footprint on social media. I'm just trying to do what common sense says. And the fact that, you know, I was told by a number of reporters, journalists who wrote uh, uh, profiles about me, in, in, including the New York Times Magazine, many other, uh, The Guardian, just over the past six months, uh, there were half a dozen of them. Um, they said that I'm the most known scientist right now in the world, but it's really irrelevant as far as I'm concerned because, you know, I jog every morning at sunrise. I have my routine. I get uh, half of my calories out of chocolate. And, uh, <laughs> I just don't care what other people think. And, you know, it's very rewarding because when I was on the expedition, for example, I got uh, an email because I wrote diary reports and they were translated to Spanish. Millions of people around the world read them and, I, I got uh, emails, uh, one of them from uh, a person in Denmark who wrote that uh, he just had a stroke. And reading my diary reports gave him strength to wow. live uh, his life. And, uh, you know, that that is the most rewarding email message I ever got. And um, wow. so people often approach me and say things that... Um, really move me and you know whenever I go to my office I get a lot of fan mail that they collect and the the, the strange thing is that um, you know there is a saying in Judaism that um, uh, n nobody can be a prophet in their own town uh, and so the people that surround me very closely you know students postdocs that work with me or actually colleagues they're not aware of the bigger world right right uh, but when I go places, if I, you know, very often people approach me and ask me for a selfie. They ask me. For... So it's um, it's really strange because I used to belong only to this uh, small community of professionals that are just doing right. things among them and the, the, uh, trying to impress each other. I'm not I sure. mean, is that also the problem, too, for these folks that they're. It is a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. But I, I, I see a much bigger world right yeah. now. And. You know, I've been to so many things uh, over the past few years that, um, you know, I would never dream of, 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 of doing. And I mean, there is a, a Netflix uh, documentary uh, crew that is uh, following me and uh, hopefully the, the video will, I mean, the, the documentary will come out um, in 2025 and they came right. with me to the uh, ship, the expedition and I was jogging there every morning as I do on land. And uh, one day they, uh, they woke up early in the morning and they filmed me jogging and they asked me to jog three times longer than I usually do. And uh, it was about uh, 10 miles that morning. Wow. And uh, uh, they said, faster, faster. And <laughs> it's only for a segment of a few minutes, they might, or maybe even less than a minute. Probably less. But um, the, produce, the director said... Um, Avi, it looks like you're running. Are you running away from something or towards something? Mm -hmm. And I said both. Mm -hmm. I'm running away from some of my colleagues <laughs> who have strong opinions but are not seeking evidence. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the second part has a romantic sense to it because, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a partner out there and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because I know that it would change everything for yeah. our species if, yeah, if really we find would. it well avi thank you very much for for joining me and thank you for for having me and uh you mentioned medium how can people find out more about you and uh tell us about your two books that you have um, out and right so um every day or two i post uh, an essay on medium and often you can just subscribe for all these essays for free just to um follow the updates on my work uh, but uh, right now, you know, as of now, uh, I published um, two books, uh, Extraterrestrial, that uh, was translated to 26 languages wow. and became a bestseller, and uh, Interstellar more recently. And um, I'm actually now working on a, a third book, um, 
two books actually one for uh, the public uh, in the spirit of these two other books but okay. the, another one for children the young adults and wow. the, I feel that it's important to inspire them to become scientists great uh, and um, uh, we are now planning the next expedition uh, hopefully within the coming year uh, it will cost six and a half million dollars because we would aim to find bigger pieces of the object in the wreckage of the first interstellar meteor and wow. we will use um, a remotely operated vehicle with um, a video feed that will tell us uh, what we're looking at in the ocean floor. And so that should be quite exciting if it happens. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I also have some other project uh, uh, that is even more exciting, but I cannot speak about right okay. now. <laughs> and, um, you know, in, in, in a month or so, I'm supposed to um, be a keynote speaker uh, in a special evening uh, on Capitol Hill. So that wow. would be an interesting event. Uh, so altogether, you know, every day that passes, there are surprises. And my life is interesting to me right now. <laughs> I really, you know, my, I, I'm really trying to find something new, and I hope we will. But yeah. um, you you will hear about it no matter what even you know even if we look at a billion objects and none of them looks anomalous you will hear about it well i think life's about to get a lot more interesting so <laughs> thank you yeah it's a, it's it's a road that was not taken a path that was not taken in the words of um, uh, frost um, robert frost who actually lived not very far from my home and um, if you take a path that was not taken there is a chance you will find some low-hanging fruits yeah. because nobody picked them up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, that's what we're doing. All right, Avi. Appreciate it. That Thank was you. great.